as Jimmy's playing around with his camera. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, shit. Now that's too much. Now what the hell's going on there? Okay. 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 <laughs> Let me just, we got to get this right. This is Hollywood, man. We're live. We're live. And here we are. And uh, trying, to get the, trying to get the camera right live. Look at that. Right, so we're live. Here we're we are. live, streaming on a metal voice. And you know, guys, I finally have a reason to wear my shirt. Jimmy is playing around with go. his camera. Hold on. We just got a loop there. I fixed it. See, I finally got a chance to wear my Alcatraz shirt that Giles sent me a long time ago. Look at that. Hey? There you go. Oh, cool. All right. Today on the Metal Voice, a lot of controversy, a lot of comments, a lot of posts, a lot of statements. We need some clarification. Just want to start things off by saying this is not, this is going to be a respectful. I mean, uh, you know, Graham's not here to defend himself and we're going to act in the most appropriate, kind manner. Uh, I respect, personally, I respect, and I know you guys respect Graham immensely and everybody behind Graham we respect immensely and I'm here to make sure everything stays neutral cool and clean and um and that's it and uh I'm going to start things off of course we have Giles who is the uh, the current manager of Alcatraz Giles Lavery who's also my friend and that's why I want to keep it very very neutral and of course uh Jimmy Waldo the uh, keyboardist for Alcatraz a uh, founding one of the founding members of Alcatraz and still is a member of Alcatraz so guys, what's going on? How are you doing today? Okay. Uh, doing good, Jimmy. Thank you. Doing for, good. How are you doing? Okay. Thanks for having us. All right. Alcatraz. I'm just going to give everybody a little bit of background here. Alcatraz was formed in 1983 by Graham Bonnet, Jimmy Waldo, and Gary Shee. Is it Gary Shee? Pronounced Shee? Shea. 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 Good Shea. Gotcha. Um, A lot of people know the band for, you know, Ingvi Malmsteen as beginnings. Of course, Steve Vai, Danny Johnson, and uh, the current guitarist, Joe Stump. And it was posted by, by let's call it the this version of Alcatraz, that Doogie White would be touring in 2021 with the band. Alcatraz is, is extremely excited to be able to announce that our good friend Doogie White will be singing with us for all of 2021 tour dates. After that, maybe a few hours later, Graham Bonnet went to his Facebook page, and I'm not going to read everything, I'm just going to highlight here. Uh, I will still be recording and performing with Alcatraz, and... Um, I am the founding founder and main songwriter and have been since the band's inception in 83. I'm currently in the studio finishing the third Graham Bonnet band album. And once delivered, I'll be working on a new Alcatraz record and I will announce the new Alcatraz lineup. And then we had another post by Graham Bonnet maybe an hour ago. Uh, I've toured with Doogie White in the past with Michael Schenker and he's a good friend and a damn fine performer. In my opinion, there is no such thing as too much music. People can listen to one or another or both versions and choose whatever they like. I'm not interested in squabbling over a name. That's cool. I'd rather just make music and that's cool. But there's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't read because I'll let you guys sort of like get into, explain. And I'm going to run out of breath. <laughs> no guess. There's too much to say. Guys, yeah. I'm going to start off with Jimmy. And just so everybody has context on what we're talking about, Jimmy... Tell me how the band started, the inception of the band Alcatraz. Um, Graham's manager, Andy Truman, at the time, who's no longer with us. He passed away some years ago. Uh, Andy was looking to put a band together with Graham. And uh, Andy found Gary Shea and myself. And uh, we met with Andy and Graham. Uh, and it seemed like a good vibe. So we went over to Graham's house and uh, Gary and I, and worked on a couple of songs with Graham in his garage. And uh, one of which was General Hospital, which was on the first Alcatraz record. And uh, seemed like a good vibe. The plan at the time was to have uh, some other guys in the band from England, and uh, that didn't work out. So we, just, we had to find a drummer and a uh, guitar player. So we started auditioning people, and we had a record deal at the time Ruckshire Records had already basically signed the band and was waiting on us to finish the lineup so we could start a record. And um, we found, uh, we auditioned a bunch of drummers and found Jan Yavina and we auditioned some guitar players and found Ingve. Ingve seemed like a good fit because he was in the, in the right vein. We were doing like a, a rainbow kind of thing, you know, a heavier version of that maybe, but uh and Graham was happy with him. We were all happy with him. So, and Ingve was a, a good writer. So uh, we started, we immediately started working together writing. 
Okay. Uh, I, I know he, Clive Burr, right? Clive Burr was considered one of the drummers. Clive Burr was. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work out. Uh, Clive was not in good health at the time. And a uh, real sweet guy. And uh, we worked with him for about three days. It just didn't work out, uh, and, and really because of his health problems. Uh, the guy was not doing well, and he was giving it his best shot, but we could see. I knew it when he walked in the door that he was not a well guy, Okay. And, um, but a real sweetheart and a real pro and a good drummer. It just wasn't working, you know, so uh, and I, I attribute that to his health problems. All right. But, so, um, yeah, yeah and, and, and just I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to make sure we get in no. as much information as possible. So so there's four albums that were recorded with Alcatraz, right? Four albums in the history of the band. Yeah, three albums and a live album, yes. And a live album. And and you were on all of them, and you and Gary were on in them. Like, you participated in the songwriting and compositions. And, I mean, it was a band effort, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, like I said, the, No Parole from Rock and Roll, which is our most successful record. And uh, that's the essence of the band is No Parole from Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. Uh and uh, Ingve and I, he lived with me for a while, so we put the material together. Ingve wrote a lot of that stuff, and I, I would contribute bits and pieces. In some cases, I would write all the music, and Ingve would interpret what I was writing. But the bottom line is, Ingve and I put all that together. Graham, uh, like I said, it already had a couple of songs ready to go. So uh, Graham wrote lyrics and melody to the rest of the stuff. And then uh, his two songs, Ingve and I interpreted those mm -hmm. and we recorded. And that's the way the first album came together. Okay. So, and then, and I'm going to bring Giles in sl slowly here. So the band comes out with three albums. The band just sort of gets dismantled, I guess, over the years. Right. And then there's sort of like a touring version of the band with Graham. Right later yeah. on but not a recording version right Is no right? graham uh, Gra me and graham have had many conversations about this now um and this is where we are gonna uh, probably agree have to agree to disagree with some of what graham has said mm -hmm. um and that if you uh, refer to numerous interviews that graham's given in recent years in particular in in uh, promotion of the new album born innocent uh, one could also refer to the death forever german magazine that came out about three months ago where graham was interviewed he at the suggestion of a guitar player he was working at, working with uh, as part of his solo band at the time, a guy called Howie Simon suggested that Graham resurrect the Alcatraz name. They called it Alcatraz featuring Graham Bonnet. And this, this took place between, I believe, 2003 to 2013. Graham has told me, and he's made many, many public statements, that this was Alcatraz in name only. It was not the original band. It was an effort to secure some more bookings by using the name. And he didn't consider it really Alcatraz because there was no other original members, such as Jimmy Waldo or Gary Shea. Now, he's, he's made those statements this year. Uh, and and we, we would agree with him that this, that was not to be considered Alcatraz. There were no other original members all right. at all. All right, so... So let's let's get into this now. So we've we've gotten the sort of recording history of the first three albums. We, there was a sort of a offshoot touring version of Alcatraz, and then Graham's I, solo band, and they used them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, a, a, sort of like a touring banner of Alcatraz. But then, whose idea was it to sort of resurrect the name Alcatraz and to create this new album? Which, which did pretty well, like Born Innocent. Yeah, it, it did. The idea was mine. Um, we were, uh, Jimmy was involved in the Graham Bonnet band uh, uh, who recorded two records, The Book and Meanwhile Back in the Garage, uh, the first one in, in 2016, yeah. the second one in 2018. Touring in support of the second album, we were at a venue called Brick by Brick, which, uh, Jimmy, where was that venue? Uh, San Diego. San Diego, I thought We've so. played it before. Um... It was that night um, we were having a few discussions about the future and where we could go to, to perhaps, uh, you know, move to the next step. And that was when I, I suggested, Graham, how about we, we have Jimmy already in the Graham Bonnet band. Most people know Jimmy from Alcatraz. Most people know the name Alcatraz, but not necessarily the name Graham Bonnet, not necessarily the name Jimmy Waldo. However, they, do, they sure as hell know who Alcatraz was. So we decided that night to reform Alcatraz properly and do a record properly 
and very much uh, re reconnect with the style of the first album, which, as Jimmy said, is the most popular Alcatraz album. Uh, you know, the neoclassical uh, direction of Yngwie Malmsteen, as opposed to some of the later versions of the band with Steve Vai or Danny Johnson, which were a little bit more, you know, jazz chords and just a, you know, a little bit different, not bad at all, just different. The first album is what resonates most with the fans we have found. Okay. All right. And uh, do you want anything to add there, uh, Jimmy Waldo? Um, no, not really. Like I said, like Giles said, we did the Grand Bonnet Band and we just felt that we'd do better if we uh, move the chessboard pieces around a little bit and then started doing Alcatraz, but leaning on that, on the heavy influence of No Parole from Rock and Roll, because that's what everybody wanted to hear. Even in the Grand Bonnet Band, as we would tour the world and people were constantly requesting stuff off that record that we were not yeah. playing. We were doing a lot of stuff off other records and uh, it was obvious. It was just like one of those obvious things that those were the songs that people wanted to hear. And like Giles said, it wasn't about, you know, Graham or me or Ingve even. It was about they love those songs. And uh, so, so I, mean, we, I, mean, I, I guess it's an they had to be done justice. They had to be the right guitar player to pull that off. Gotcha. All right. All right. So so now I guess we're we've we've discussed the past and how it moved. Now we're into the his and to the present, where of course we're in this COVID situation. There's no tour can't support the album tell me about the creating of born innocent just the creation of that album maybe um well it in the beginning it's it started with pulling some uh, pulling from drawing from guitar players from graham and mine our past which was bob kulik graham and i had a band with bob called blackthorn which did okay and um uh, so we thought we'd get Bob involved and do a couple of songs. Dario Molo in Italy, who Graham had done a record with and toured with successfully and really liked Dario's writing and, and playing. So we decided to bring him in. And uh, Chris and Pelletieri, whereas Graham had done a couple of records yeah. with Chris. Um, Annihilator, Jeff Waters was on it, I believe. He did a, he did a solo, yeah. yeah. He did a solo. He's a friend of Giles, so he did a solo for us. Um, but anyway, we pulled those people in, in the meantime, looking for a guitar player, because the guy we had at the current time as a permanent touring guitar player uh, was not working out at all. And um, so we began looking for a guitar player. So when we found Joe Stump during, <laughs> during the recording of a lot of this material with these other people, uh, Joe, it was, became obvious that Joe was the perfect guy because of his influence the neoclassical influence, but his also his musicality. He's a Berkeley teacher. Joe is a very well-schooled uh, writer, composer, player. So he was the perfect guitar player. So once we got Joe in the band, we leaned heavily on Joe's writing. And the thing that I wrote once Joe got in the band was thinking about Joe. So we were definitely leaning way more on that direction which it was obvious that that was the way to go. It was just, it, it, nobody had to tell anybody anything. Uh, it was just obvious that that was really working. We'd found the right guy and Joe is this great guy and easy to work with, but really knows his shit. And, right. uh, and, we and you, you and Giles, you got you and Giles produced it. Uh, Graham contributed, you guys, Gary contributed, you contributed. So tell me about that, Giles. Tell me about the Well, we need, to, we need to just back up a little bit. All right, we, sure. we, 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 we did go on the road. Oh, okay. Touring with Joe Stump. Um, and, you know, at that point, we were um, planting the seed for what was going to be the, the, the future of Alcatraz, the next record. Uh, we still had some dates that were contracted as Graham Bonnet Band. So we did go, uh, we, we did go out on the road as, you know, with Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, we, when we got back, uh, I mean, we had a particularly hard tour in the UK, uh, it was September last year, where um, this this Graham was struggling with some some you know real legitimate back pain. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and uh, it it was it it was real tough on him, and he really um, did his best every single night. Um, however, uh, you know he was he was struggling. 
And I mean, Jimmy, you may you may want to elaborate here. You may have a take on this as well. Uh, your impressions. I mean, being on stage and watching him across the stage, you could see it. Uh, I have back problems myself. Nothing like Graham had. Graham ended up, as you probably know, having a back back surgery and plates and steel put in his back. I could see the pain every night. He would come off stage. He couldn't even walk down the stairs. He couldn't get on the on the in the van. We had to help. I mean, he was in rough shape physically but, so, he, but he still managed to pull it off right i mean he's he, he yes. like and and, yeah. and, I, and that's what i admired about graham he really you know matter what much pain he was in he just he did his job right oh, that was great he, absolutely no he he pulled it off and it was not easy yeah yeah that's good no, it was yeah. not easy at all um we got uh we got off the road and we got home and this was probably around christmas time last year uh and then early earlier in the year um Bethany decided, uh, I don't even think she decided, she had no choice. Her parents were unwell at the time and she she was not able to commit to the type of touring that, that you know we were going to do and, and as, I'm sure as much as she would want to be there, she wasn't able to because she had to be there for her parents. So she, she stepped down. What happened then is this opened the door for us to really start thinking about bringing back as close to the original lineup of Alcatraz as, as is possible and that was bringing back Gary Shea on bass. So now we have the three people that started the band are now back and reunited as the, under the Alcatraz banner. We have Joe Stump, who, you know, I'll be damned. You close your eyes. That guy is playing. If you listen to those early songs performed live, the no parole stuff live, you close your eyes and it sounds like the record. Joe can really, really deliver the goods. And, and, and as well as be incredibly creative on his own and write songs in that style. So right, right at that point, and then we had a great drummer, Mark Bankachea, and we still do have a great drummer called Mark Bankachea. So we were primed now to make the Alcatraz record that always should have been the follow-up to No Pro from Rock and Roll. And that is, that, is what we, that is what we endeavored to do. That is ultimately what we did. However, this is also where things became a little bit challenging with Graham. Um, and I'm, you know, and Graham has made no secret. He is not the biggest fan of heavy metal. He is also not the biggest fan of this type of shred guitar playing, uh, this, this type of thing. He would, you know, I have text messages from him. I have emails from him. And, you know, God bless him. Not every, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah, you know, uh, it's not even my cup of tea a lot of the times. I mean, it's just, it's said, just, it's all taste. I'm right? not, I don't like this whittle diddle guitar shit. I don't, I don't like this, this heavy metal, this, you know, Graham does like heavy music and he, and he, and there's going to be some, from what I understand, there's going to be some heavy stuff on his solo record that he's working on, but uh, he's not a fan of where we wanted to go musically. Yeah. Jimmy and I produced this record uh, and we were just finding Graham was disengaging more and more and more throughout the making of the record. He was dealing with back surgery. Uh, he was dealing with a number of other issues that I will not go into here. Um, and we did give him time to recover. And then we did give him, you know, the, the chance to come into the studio when he was comfortable. We would go and pick him up and we would drive him there or I would arrange a lift or he would arrange his own transport to the studio, whatever he felt comfortable with. But we would find he would, he just, his heart just was not in this music or this record, Born Innocent. But so there's we nothing were, wrong with that either, right? There's just nothing wrong with that, right? If you it, if you don't like a style, a you don't like bit, a style. It's right? a little bit frustrating when when you've got a band that are kind of all on ten, and then you've got another guy that's kind of on five that's would rather be anywhere else but doing what we're what we're trying to do here, which is you know with budgets these days the way they are, record companies rightly so cannot afford to pay the kind of money that they used to be able to give artists to do a record. This is just the the modern. Um, I guess the modern format, you know, the, the people are not buying records like they used to. So everything is smaller. Time is money. We're, you know, we're, we're paying by the hour for studio time. And when Graham comes in unprepared or having lyric sheets and not remembering which song goes with which words that he had written the day before, and just generally not, not really being there for us as, as the lead singer, we needed him to be at that point it became very, very frustrating. And at about song number eight, he told us, I think we have enough songs for this record. I, I don't I don't want to do anymore. Now, as we know, eight songs on a record these days just isn't going to cut it. 
Now, to me, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you guys. It sounds like you guys wanted one musical direction, and he wanted another musical direction. Because if I was in a band and someone told me let's do this, a style that I'm not interested in, I wouldn't have my heart in it either, right? And, and I'm just playing the other side here, right? It sure. just sounds like a, a difference of musical direction. That That's kind of the, all it sounds like. The, the, the real problem with that is, though, is when you sit down with an individual and you and you say, this is, a, this is the direction that, let's just say the industry and the band want to go in. And when your singer agrees to it and says, no problem at all, I can write that stuff very, very easily. You know, because he would... Every single song on this record, except one, musically was written by either the, the band or one of the guest guitar players that we used on this album. Graham wrote one song musically called For Tony, which is the final song on the record. Everything else was composed by Joe Stump, Jimmy Waldo, or the guitar players such as Chris Impelletary or Bob Kulik or Dario Molo, Nazumo Wakai or any of the um, people we used as special guests or outside writers on this record. So when Graham makes a statement and says, I was the, um, what did he say, Jimmy? He said, I was the uh, primary songwriter and always have, has been. Yeah, and, and he has said those statements before and, and upset some past guitar players that he'd worked with. And, and to be honest, I mean, I, I don't know if Graham meant he wrote the lyrics and the melody because he always does, but he sort of said things to the effect that he wrote everything. And then he, he even said that to me about past records he'd done that I know better. So, so, uh, it, so guys, is this statement true then? I mean, let's just break it down. I'm still, I will still, uh, I am the founder and main songwriter and have been since the band's inception in 1983. I mean, he uh, has oh, been one of the co-founders, I would say, right? Absolutely, that's true. As in regards to the songwriting, that is that is that is false. He has certainly written the lyrics and the vocal melodies, but to to suggest that the his statement would imply that somewhere around 85, 90% of the music was written by Graham Bonnet, that is absolutely not true. Um, uh, let's talk to someone who was there. I mean, Jimmy will elaborate. Well, it, it's just... It's just a slap in the face, and and uh, it's it's not fair because I give Graham all the credit in the world. He writes, uh, whether they work for a genre or not, he writes incredible lyrics and great melodies, and and I know that, and I can count. We could always count on that, and and so on. But to shouldn't should not take credit for things you didn't do, and uh, I didn't. I mean, like I said, the first album that was primarily Ingve's writing i contributed some um i, I so did graham I, though but graham did too like oh graham time. wrote yeah. the lyrics and the melody to yeah. everything yeah yeah exactly so major contribution you obviously you need that but the underlying tone of the record was set by ingve and us uh we set the tone for it and graham just went oh okay great also i can write over that and so that's the way a band works though that's not unusual i mean uh whatever band uh usually it's the the if it's a guitar driven band that's the way it works you put down the music the band sets the tone like in rainbow that was not that was richie blackmore setting the tone for that band those riffs and things were so, so jimmy so what i'm hearing here is this is what i'm hearing i'm hearing like graham you are one of the founders graham you did contribute a lot but so did we but so did we. Please don't leave us out. So did we. Well, you, all, you just right? credit where credit is due. That's okay, all. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. No, I mean, and, and we're, we're going to be fair here. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, and if you look at the credits on the records, the yeah, writing yeah, credits, yeah. you'll you'll see it, it, it's it's pretty obvious. But uh, and Graham's a great writer, but he he doesn't like this kind of music, so it is tough for him because he hates heavy metal and he hates this kind of guitar playing. And this is what it needs. This is what we do. I love this kind of music and, and always have. And, I, you know, there's been frustrating times, like with Ingve at times. He was frustrating to work with sometimes, but I loved his guitar playing. The guy was just from another planet. Amazing. Uh, but Graham got burnt out on that kind of guitar playing. He always felt that, that he was getting overshadowed by those guitar players. And 
what the guitar player, what are they supposed to do? Is this kind of music? This is what the people want. And Graham was filling the bill perfectly. Graham had the right, he was the right piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. but he just was not happy being there. Okay, at all. Well, and, and that's fine. I mean, you know, everybody, yeah. You know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you guys no. believe this direction. He believed that direction. And that's fine. I mean, they're, they're, again, yeah. but, you've, so, but you've got to look at what is right for the band and what is right. There is no sense in, in, in reforming Alcatraz, the three original members, and then not sounding anything like Alcatraz. That makes no sense at all. Yeah, no, okay, I, fair enough. Um, so, okay, so now the decision that you guys made was, you know, we're going to have, it's, it's strange enough because I saw this, I saw your statement originally and you said, we're going to get Doogie White for touring in 2021, correct? That is that is what we are comfortable announcing at, at this point. We are kicking the ball around with Doogie uh, is it creatively as well. But nobody right said now, he joined the band. You just said, if I read it right, it just, I, I think everybody misinterpreted it in the press saying he's joined the band. But you guys actually just said, and I'm going to read it. We're, we are extremely excited to be able to announce that our good friend Doogie White will be singing with us for our 2021 tour dates. That's it. That is correct. That, that, that is what we are comfortable announcing at this point. Exactly. And I think everybody twisted in the press that he's now part of the band, right? And there is a difference. Well, there, there is a difference the, there. There's a difference in what we're comfortable to announce right now. Yes. Yes. I, let's just say that there's, 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 hey, the possibilities with Doogie are endless and we are exactly exactly we are keeping uh the door is always open for Doogie to do more absolutely and we are being creative with Doogie at this point the guys are and um that's all we're comfortable announcing at this point all right so here's a split now you're going your way Graham's going his way tell me about that Okay, well, well, Jim, I would, Jimmy, and I will have to back up a little bit here sure, to, no problem. and 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 again, um, we got to about song eight on the Born Innocent record, eight songs into writing what ultimately became a fourteen-song record, um, I believe, sixteen tracks if you uh, have the Japanese edition. Now, Graham was having some some personal problems, which, as I said, I'm not going to talk about here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was becoming a struggle for him to perform live for a couple of different reasons. One of them being his back problem, which, um, Hey, that can happen to, that could happen to me tomorrow, you know, so I'm not and, and could he's happen getting to over it. Right. So it's good. Uh, he did turn very negative and very dark saying, why are we dragging the Alcatraz corpse around? Why are we resurrecting this thing one more time? Why are we doing this? I'm tired of, his words to me was, I'm tired of being used as a puppet for these uh, shreddy guitar players. The shred term is a term that you're probably familiar with. I, I'm sick of this music and I hate this heavy metal shit. And right. he said those words to Jimmy Waldo as well. Okay, well, we're not going to get into the he said, she said kind of thing, right? But let's let's just... You want the story? <laughs> I don't, you know, like to me, it's like, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I mean, Graham is not Cause, like... Because there's context, too, here. Maybe he said it in a certain context. Ab absolutely. Maybe right? he was... And, and that's why, you know, we just can't isolate but, one but when, but when, you, when But when you hear it repeatedly, when you're... When, when everyone's trying to be... Making a record is tough, as it is. And when 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 everyone's pulling together and trying to get... You know, you, it's no, you don't make any money making a record these days. You're lucky if you break even with the hope that the record will do well. And I always say these days, you uh, you make a record to, to promote your live show. You used to put on your live show to promote your record. And so when you're hearing th this sort of negativity time and time and time and time again, this was not an isolated incident. He just doesn't like this kind of music, as Jimmy said. And Jimmy and I produced this record. And honestly, it was like, it was like pulling teeth to get this record finished with Graham. And he may have his own reasons for that, but there was a point where he did, uh, we did push through this and, uh, you know, we went through a dark patch with him, but then towards the last two weeks of the record, where we still had about four songs left to do, uh, Graham did become motivated again. And he did, uh, you know, I thought the dark cloud had passed and we were really, you know, it felt like we were on the same page. 
And it was at that point that we went out to a Mexican restaurant, uh, Jimmy and I and Graham, after a day at the studio where he sung fantastically. And we, I had a copy of the contract printed out, a number of, actually a, a number of contracts, one of them also being the contract for his solo album, where he signed and he agreed to what Alcatraz activity was in store for the next couple of years, being recording and touring with this lineup. Mm -hmm. uh, and Graham's never been a contract guy. Like I, I would, I would always read him uh, the details, and he would, you know, I kind of got the feeling he's kind of eyes glazing over, going, "Yeah, you know, that's all fine, that's all fine," and he'd sign at the bottom, you know. But I made sure he understood exactly. Um, I said, you know, please put your phone away. I need you to understand what we're about to do. We're bringing Gary Shea back. We're doing a record. We want to do more records. Here is the touring for the next couple of years. And he was 100% on board with all of it. He, he did complete the record. It was actually the last four songs that he wrote the vocals and um, vocal melody for were actually four of the best songs on the record. So he really had a, he was a late bloomer on that record, I guess you could say. And that was really, really fantastic what he came up with. And we were very happy. We were, we were thinking, right, okay, cool. I mean, you know, everyone has a, you know, it, making a record is different for a lot of people. Some people get very dark and when they're in the creative stage or if they, it's not sort of a direction they're into, but whatever, you know, everyone deals with this their own way. We did, finished the album in you know in a good place with graham absolutely and good. um yeah. he's not the kind of guy that wants to sit and listen to the mixes and you know he's just like are we done are we good have you got everything you need okay i don't ever want to hear it again you know that's just that's just what that's just what he's like and i'm a little like that with my records too so i can i can 100 percent relate to that so we, we delivered the record to, to to our japanese label and to our um the label for the rest of the world uh everything seemed to be in the right place and Graham did uh, initially start doing the interviews and the press for the record, as did the other members. And that is kind of where things started going south. Um, Jimmy, you might want to pick it up from here. Well, thought everything was on track. I mean, Graham was having his back problems. Uh, I mean, he still did have some back problems. Uh, he had a, a surgery, I believe, in December or January, uh, but even after that, it, would, it took a while before he was going to be right again. And uh, he was in the process of, uh, he had split up with his current girlfriend and was in the process of moving back to his condo. And he moved into a hotel for a couple of weeks out in Santa Clarita, uh, waiting for his condo to be vacated and cleaned and all that stuff. I came back, I'm living in Chicago. So I came back and worked with him every day at his hotel to help him. We, we were gonna try to do some music, but that wasn't gonna happen. So I ended up just driving him to doctor's appointments to get x-rays and stuff because he had, he had hurt himself again after the surgery. So we were both, I, I was really worried about him and he was worried. And so we were going to the hospital. I was taking him for that stuff and getting groceries and doing all that stuff. We were everything was fine. And then uh, <laughs> somewhere in there, I, I got the keys to his condo. I went over and checked it out and made sure that was okay. Went to the bank and Giles had suggested to try to get the mortgage put on hold to give us, give Graham some ease on the money uh, since the COVID thing had just started. So we went to the bank. Giles had set up the account with the mortgage company, we went to the bank and shut it off so that the mortgage company wouldn't be taking Graham's money from him. And I sat with Graham and the officer at the bank and turned the screen around and I said, you understand what we're doing? And Graham's like, yeah, great, thank you. And everything was fine. And then <laughs> um, within a day or two, things started to get dark. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know why, but things got kind of weird and I came back to Chicago and he stopped communicating with us at that point. And it got, it was, it had been really rough for me personally. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I had, I, I mean, 
I'd had enough of the negativity and of, it's just in general, not just from Graham, but wherever it came from about the kind of music or whatever. So I was, I was at wit's end, like trying to make this thing work. And it, it uh, sounded like both of you, and I know you both, you really cared about the guy and his well-being and his health. Oh yeah. I mean, and you and, know and, what? And for I years, did. I know. I do. I did. I do. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Yeah. We really do. And this is, this is, oh, this is, extremely disappointing because and i'm sorry to cut you off jimmy no that's okay first and foremost i thought we were friends i i don't i'm not going to comment on graham's financial status or anything like that but there is a covid covid relief uh thing that his his uh finance company for his condo was offering so like a lot of people currently in this position you you take advantage of, of you know touring musicians need to tour when there's no touring there's no income so there was a COVID relief thing, we were just, that was what we were looking at. That's what that was about. Um, and we, we were going out, you know, we were in, I was at, I was in LA at the time. We were, you know, I was, I was on holiday over there and we were going out to dinner with Graham. It was, you know, and he was telling us, you guys are my, you guys, are, I love you guys. You guys are like family, you know, we, you know, we, and we were having some, it was good vibes, you know, his, his daughter was helping him um, get organized as well. Because he had split with his girlfriend, who he has since reconnected with, and and I'm very happy that that's happened. Um, yeah. But what what happened suddenly was that Graham. I mean, we were going to help. Uh, Jimmy was going actually going to help Graham with his solo record and play on that, and that was going to be a different sort of direction. That was that was something that I said to Graham. Look, Alcatraz, you don't love this music at all. You've told me how much you don't like it. So here's a solo album. Here's a chance for you to. This is your direction. This is your record, Graham. This is not a the band. This is your record. You can have whoever you want on it. And I, and again, we you know I print the contract out. We sat at his daughter's place yet again. We went through the contract. He understood exactly what was going on. We we always do a budget for a record. Always write it out. You know, make him aware of what's going on. Uh, Graham doesn't sort of retain numbers and, and, and statistics and things like that he'll quite often come back and say what was that and, and you know I'm happy to explain everything again no problem but all of it and then Mark our drummer uh, during the COVID thing Graham was living in his condo by himself it was it was very extremely scary for anybody um, especially people over 60 you know the the COVID-19 you know the pandemic the thing we're all living with right now so I, you know, I, I made, I, I rang up one of our, f our former guitar players and, and asked him to go check on Graham periodically. Uh, I asked our drummer to go and check on Graham periodically. Uh, he and his wife went and actually brought Graham some groceries. Um, I, I helped Graham in, you know, in a couple of, you know, different ways as well. You know, from, from, you know, I was back in Germany at that point when the pandemic thing really kicked off. And I, you know, I, I, I cared about him. I said, I, I sent him a text message, which I still have to this, to this day. I've got all the text messages between me and Graham. I said, don't worry, Graham. We will take, we, we've got, we've got you. You know, we, we, we're your friends and we've got your back, literally, you know. And he said, thank you so much. You know, once again, you guys are, I mean, he, 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 he said Jimmy Waldo was an angel. He, he wrote that to me. He goes, oh my God, Jimmy's an angel. I can't believe it. You know, I think he was talking about me. Maybe he's talking about you. Okay, that's, maybe that's why this, this that could be the that could be the cause of this whole misunderstanding. I, I think it's me. He's talking Jimmy, me. I was the angel. But but anyway, I just a little was, comic relief there. Sorry. It was good vibes. All of a sudden, he stops communicating with us. Um, I understand that he had um, gone back together with his girlfriend. That's great, but we had an album to promote. Next, I mean, I had, and I had a couple of mutual friends and I was, I was, you know, I'm like, have you heard from Graham? I haven't heard from him in two weeks. You know, I was legitimately worried. I mean, worried because as far as I knew, I didn't know if he was at the condo by himself and if he had, you know, a guy that's just had some back problems, fallen over, hurt himself, COVID, whatever. Right? COVID. I didn't know. And I finally got him on the phone one time and I said, I am worried sick about you, Matt. And he goes, oh, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'm uh, all right. Okay, well, you know, we've got some interviews for next Tuesday. Are you okay with them? And he said, yeah, okay. Then he missed, um, he did miss some interviews, which gave me, once again, cause for concern. And then 
that's when the communication stopped. He, he would not reply to any communication from myself and very sporadically with, with Jimmy. Now, I understand he did have some phone problems at one point, but he, I mean, heck, you know, you got to stay in touch with your band and your manager. And he did get a new phone, but we did not, we didn't, we didn't hear from him. He stopped communicating with us. And next thing you know, we hear that he's doing a, he was uh, doing a band with, with his girlfriend, Beth and me again. And hey, that's, that's great. And, and, Conrado Pesonado, the uh, guitar, original guitar player of the Graham Bonnet Band. And uh, since they've recruited Mark Zonder to play on that record, my, my good friend Mark Zonder. So he was doing... Uh, the only way that he would continue to do interviews for this record was the, the record company had to get involved and, and give him his interview schedule. He was not responding to me or to Jimmy. We couldn't... There was just radio silence. So finally, the record company got involved and gave him his interview, interview schedule. And Graham was happy to uh, do what he was, you know, fulfill his obligations press-wise uh, as long as the label were asking. Uh, however, he would not respond to anything I was sending him, any anything, any sort of uh, friendly greeting or professional email at all. Uh, and then he, during these Alcatraz interviews, he started... Oh, interviews that were meant to be promoting the Alcatraz record, he was talking about my new band with Beth and me and Con Conrad. And that kind of went, oh, okay. Hmm. All right. So he's talking about a solo album. Well, what about Alcatraz? Um, so, and, and again, it just became very, very frustrating. We could, I could, I could not, a month went by and I was having to get information from mutual friends. It was all a very, very frustrating situation. At that point, I decided to send my resignation to Graham because this, you know, this was just when I thought that the, the dark cloud of making the record had lifted and we, we had tour dates, we had all kinds of things. I said, I can no longer personally represent you, Graham. I, I still manage, you know, I, I, I still manage the rest of the band. Now bands can have more than one manager. I mean, Black Sabbath had three managers, you know, Tony had his manager and Ozzy had his manager and Giza Butler had his manager. I mean, that's just that's just a fact of life in bands. But I, I could no longer do this where I was worrying sick about Graham every day and wondering if he's going to do an interview or not do an interview. And I just said, look, Graham, this is perhaps it's time where we, we have to call it a day, you and me. You know, we've had a great six years. I'm very, very proud of what we've achieved. And um, but, you know, we do have some unfinished business. And, and I, you know, I'm going to tell you something, Giles. I'm just going to toss us toss that out there. I, I know what you're saying is sincere because I've known you for a very long time and I've known your passion of working with Graham and the excitement oh, when yeah. you first started, when you first started working with Graham, it was like off the yeah. charts. You were like the happiest guy in the world. And you know how much I care about Graham and yeah, you yeah. And, I, and, and Jimmy, when I, I met I really, you, I mean, I know your, 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 your passion for it all. Uh, and, I, and you know what? I've got to really say thank you to Bethany. Yeah. She is the one that brought me into the into the into the Graham Bonnet fold, you know, and that's uh, something I never said to her. So that's that's, that's definitely, a, you know, something I've got to, I've got to add there too. But I did resign. Graham's statement is true. I did resign out of frustration. I have other clients. I I cannot have all my time taken up by. I mean, let's face it. Graham Graham Bonnet does not make. It doesn't. I was not not getting rich managing Graham Bonnet. Let's put it that way. And you know, it's a nor passion. should I. It's more of a passion. Nor should I. It was. It was. I cared about him, and I do care about him greatly as a person. Uh, and I I love his voice and love his. You know, oh, I know that. Music. I know that. I mean, you come to my place. You got every album's on the shelf there, and always will be. Absolutely, but he stopped communicating with us. But we did have unfinished business. So I said, Graham, we do need to have a phone call with myself or myself and the band or forget me just the band we do have some business to discuss we can't just you know sever and never see each other again there was some financial stuff to finish there was some stuff we had to get in order because we were kind of midstream here as far as records touring commitments uh contract stuff commissions etc cetera, etc cetera. uh he did i did uh, after my resignation two weeks later I got an email saying um, 
not written by Graham. I can I know it was not written by Graham. However, it came from Graham's email. It said, send all the social media logins, contracts, uh, agency contacts, record company contacts, send it all to me. Um, thank you for all you've done. I'm paraphrasing, but that's that's what he said. I I said, hang on a minute. No, no, I'm not just handing over the whole store here. Like any relation, business relationship, it's a little bit like a divorce. There is always going to be some loose ends to tie up and, you know, make sure everything's in its place so we can then, you know, settle and move forward. Uh, he did not want to jump on a call. I, I, I again invited him and I copied all the band guys in and I said, we need to talk about up, upcoming Alcatraz touring. I do still represent the guys. We have stuff booked. It's stuff that I've contracted, stuff that I've signed my name on contracts and obligations that I have to fulfill for Alcatraz. We, you know, you, you as an individual can go and get any representation you want. But as far as Alcatraz is concerned, we do have some stuff we need to deal with the right way. I'm not just going to hand over the Facebook page, when we have a record company that is, you know, we're adminning and doing stuff and uploading content in promotion of the Alcatraz record, I cannot put marketing campaigns in jeopardy just by handing over social media login. And, and, and your ass is on the line, right, Giles? Oh, your yeah. Ass, absolutely, I mean, absolutely. The record company is looking at you saying, hey, man, you got to deliver. Your name is on this contract. So is everybody a number else's, of, right? a, number, a number of different contracts. So I need to, I need to, I need to hold on to some... I need to hold on to the reins still a little bit here. We need to, I can't just hand this over to God knows who. That's and understandable you know, too. That's understandable. That's, that's, just, that's just business. But it, it seemed like he or whatever advice he was getting at the time felt that it could just be, you know, real just clean, clean break, you know, which is unfortunately not how it works. Uh, he, so I thought, well, okay. I will, I'm happy to provide the info you're asking for. But what you need to do for us is we need a little bit more information here. You need to get on a conference call, at least with me and Jimmy or Joe or, or whoever, or at least him and Jimmy and give us, let us know what's going on. Are you still in this band? Are you? And he, and he, he wrote an email saying, okay, who's up for the touring? And Jimmy wrote back to Graham and said, always into touring, but where are you at? And what, what about, you know, Giles is still our manager. You can't tell us who our manager is or isn't. So let's all get on a conference call and let's figure this out. Like, you know, a Zoom call like we're doing right now. It's There's nothing that after six years of managing Graham and 37 plus years of Jimmy knowing Graham as a friend that couldn't be figured out just with a, a Zoom call or, you know, just hearing each other's voice and just going, look, okay, there's been a misunderstanding here. There's been a misunderstanding over there. There's been some hurt feelings here. Uh, you know, anything that needed to be apologized for absolutely let's just let's talk about it let's let's figure it out however it was just radio silence that's all it was and and again i sent another email saying we've got some great offers for alcatraz some great things happening uh, i got another email back saying this sounds very interesting but once again please just send all information to graham bonnet his email and please send social media logins etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like no hold on a minute we need to talk about this. We have to, we have to have a conference call. All businesses operate this way, and this is a business. Uh, Jimmy, you may want to jump in here. Well, I I emailed Graham several times and tried to convince him to call us, and let's just let's just talk about this. And I, I knew, I was actually thinking, well, this will we'll just talk about this and figure this thing out. Yeah, exactly. And, and I wasn't about to. Like just because someone tells me, uh, hand over all this material to us. Like who's us? First of all, to me, and Graham's not a business person. I know that, and uh, and so that's my career. They're talking about there too. I don't want to mess up my relationship with labels and agencies and stuff. So, uh, like Giles said, let's get on and talk about this and figure out a way to go about this. And I've been in a couple of pretty heavy bands with more than one manager and it worked fine. So that, that could have worked. Uh, also, uh, Graham's forgetting about what Giles brings to the table in this kind of music, which is 
the booking, the direction, knowing about the, the song direction and knowing where to play and when, when we should be playing and touring and went to the right promoters, the right agencies, and, and in some cases, literally booking the gigs and knowing how to run a tour on the road as a tour manager. So all that just like seems to be forgotten. And that's, that affects me when he's, when, when it's assumed that I'm just gonna, oh, well, I'll get rid of Giles. It's like, no, I'm real, we're, Joe and I and Mark are extremely, and Gary are really happy with Giles and the direction. This is the direction I've always wanted to go. And everything was going great. It was like, yeah. And um, I'm not going to upset all that because yeah, one you know, person. I, I got to toss something out there. And, and you know, and, and I think this COVID-19 has played on a lot of people's brains, you know, in the past. It, it's really disrupted a lot of people psychologically. And uh, I, I know it's hit a lot of families and it's turned the, everybody's world upside down. I'm just going to toss that out there. You know, it's, it's just not easy, you know, confinement and, you know, dealing with, you know, problems and especially, you know, Graham was sort of like an older guy. And I, I hear all this. I hear everything you guys are saying. There's there's contracts. There's musical direction. There's COVID-19 happening in the background. You know, um, there's a lack of motivation. Right. Um, so w at what point did you guys go, OK, let's get Doogie in and. And, and let's continue on. Well, I mean, unless we I'm really, missing something here, unless I'm missing. Let me. Uh, something. We are. We, you, re, you really are missing something. I'll okay, let. I will, I will. Just in the timeline, uh, I will let Jimmy. Continue. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jimmy. Sorry uh, to cut I, you off. About you know there were Graham said some pretty nasty stuff about me, very hurtful things that came out of left field. I have no idea why, and that that kind of. That 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 was really that cut deep, and there was no reason for that. I'd never said a bad, I'd never said anything bad about the guy, and always been a friend and, and trying to help. And uh, for him to turn on me like that, that that's when I thought, you know what? Uh, I don't hate Graham, but I, I need to put my efforts and my time into something that's a going thing, like be smart, and get with people that want to do what I want to do, which I was already with, and. Uh, I got really tired of getting by second hand hearing these comments that were being made about me. And I heard them from all over the world. Uh, it being leaked out, I would say they put it on Facebook or whatever, but, and that, that really, really upset me. And um, I, I just, you know, it's just worked on me for months and my brother passed away a few months ago and that was a huge, turning point for me. And I'm not trying to throw that out there as a, as a sympathy, sympathy card, but I'm just telling you personally, that was like, I stopped and really thought about my life. What the hell am I doing with my life? And who do I want to be involved with? I want to be involved with positive people that have fun, that want it. We all in the same direction. And I really, I really feel that Graham took a left somewhere way before this and as Giles said, and I'll tell you, and you can read it in the press, that he, he dislikes this kind of music and dislikes this, dislikes this kind of music immensely. And has said that to me for a long time. And I, I kind of never took it too seriously, but it just got worse and worse. And um, so that, that just, is, is for, when you meet a guy like Doogie and you see how positive he is and what a, he's a workhorse and a great singer. So you're like, well, why would I not want to be involved with people that are going in the same direction, very talented, and we can all do the same thing at the same time and, and make this work and do well and make money. I'm kind uh, of thinking, you know, a Graham would be happy doing the Graham Bonnet thing and you guys be happy doing the Alcatraz thing. I think it's a perfect sort of Well, it, it does really, right? it, does, it does seem very strange because I heard for months and months i'm tired of hearing about alcatraz i'm tired of quote and i can back this up with text messages etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm tired of dragging the alcatraz corpse around can we just let it die yeah i mean can he's we just not motivated that's all he's just then, not motivated he, to do it. he makes a statement that uh he's going to put together a, 
another Alcatraz, which is the same thing he did in the 2000s with no original members. The same thing he said was never Alcatraz in the first place because it never had any other original members, something he was saying earlier this year. Um, it's very confusing. There was no good reason why, why this had to go the way it had to go. It was lack of communication, lack of what we're doing right now. I'm on Zoom and I can see Jimmy and I can see Jimmy. I can see two Jimmys right in front of me. So <laughs> and, and you know what? Anything can be worked out. Van, if Van Halen can work it out, we could have. Yeah. If Fleetwood Mac can work it out half a dozen times, we could have. His way of working it out was send me all the contracts, things that I've signed on behalf of, I, things that I've signed, not on behalf of anybody. I've signed them. Things that had everybody's name on them, not just his. Sign, send it all to him. Boom. Hey, happy to send it, but we need to have a conversation, a proper conversation first. Because I think that, hey, that's key. I, well, I think you're right, Giles. You know, one, one, that lines once, of you've that, once you've got all that information that you want in the social media logins, hey, how, how do we know we're, to, we're never going to hear from you ever again? You know, we, we have unfinished business. We still have unfinished business. It's strange we, how we, how we, we're using this conduit to talk to him. <laughs> Isn't it well, weird? It might be, it, it's hey, like the only way to reach him. This, maybe we should have done this six months ago. But <laughs> this, is, this is really just setting the record straight because a number, a number of comments where he, him marginalizing the talents of the other members of the band, past and present, uh, and, and implying that it was, you know, this is not a David Coverdale white snake situation as much as some people may feel that it is. This is, this is really is not. Okay. It's, so what I've been seeing, comment, a band. sorry to cut you off. I've been hearing comment after comment and I, and I heard a lot of this. Graham Bonnet is Alcatraz. Like, what does that mean to you guys? When some, when you hear a comp, see a comment like that, I'll tell you what it means is, is, usually the lead singer is perceived, you know, if it's a real lead vocalist, not just the guitar player is one of the singers, but, but a lead vocalist typically is perceived as, oh, it's his band. I mean, that's pretty normal procedure. Uh, I, I think through history and most bands that had a real lead singer, um, that's, you always perceived it as, oh, well, that's those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, except for Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, most bands you know were perceived as that's that's it the beatles they had three singers and everybody wrote and so that was not perceived that way but but most bands like ours the singer then it's perceived as his band and the and the interesting and, thing if i could just add is that alcatraz never had a fixed guitar player why did why do and there's four alcatraz albums now including the new one born innocent but let's talk about the three in the 80s why do they all sound different? Totally different from each other. Because the guitar player dictated, at the time, the guitar player dictated the direction of each album, not, not Graham. Graham certainly did his thing. And, and, and I'm, there's no bigger fan of what his vocal melodies and his lyrics than me, really. But the musical direction was always guided by whatever guitar player was in the band at the time. Currently, it's, you know, and Jimmy was certainly a songwriter as well, but currently Joe Stump is our man. And that is bringing that direction right back full circle to the way the first album sounded, only heavier and more powerful. And we want to keep going in that direction. And that is, that, that is exactly what we're going to do. And Jimmy, Jimmy's, I, hey, I'm not to say because he's right here in front of me, but Jimmy's input on Born Innocent was immense. And Jimmy's input on the two Graham Bonnet, al Bonnet Band albums was immense. Jimmy is a real get up and go and make it happen guy. He is the Jan Uvina, the old Alcatraz drummer wrote me recently. And he said, Jimmy Waldo is the, I mean, I, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, Jimmy Waldo is the engine room. He's the, he's the make it happen guy. And I, and I've, and I've sat right next to Jimmy for 12 hour, 14 hour days in the studio for three months. And I've seen, he will stop at nothing. He won't sleep. He will keep going around the clock to make, make everything the best it can possibly be. So it frustrates me when yeah. I see so people Alcatraz, getting marginalized. Alcatraz was a four-man band. And recently it was three of the original members, right? Correct. Right. Correct. I mean, no, it was a five-man band. Sorry, what am I saying? Keyboard, yes, five-man, five sorry. And you had three out of five. 
when you get which hold is on, more than most man, bands today, right? Five-man band, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess you know when someone says you know that person is the band and you guys aren't, it, it could be hurtful, and I get that. You know, I, it's I a little hard to take when you've when you've uh, you know when you're on a, when you're in a van on two hours sleep, and one of the guys that's had two hours sleep is driving the van, and when you're humping gear because you know we're not in a position to have, you know, elaborate crew and techs and people like that. And, and you know, when you're, when you're putting in, you know, you're doing a show every day for 10 days, there's no side men. Yeah. There's no, you know, marginalized members. It, there is everyone is pulling together and it is a band. And that's what, and that's what Alcatraz absolutely was. And that, and that goes for Graham as well. I, I, guess, I, I guess at the end of the day, the music will do the talking, right? The it will. music will the music because that's what it is at the end of the day if doogie white is fronting out Catraz or not if the music is fantastic people will gravitate towards it and if it sucks people won't right it, so, it's you, you know you, you, it's not gonna it's not gonna suck if if you're a fan <laughs> of course i'll say that but if you're a fan of the born innocent record get ready for more just like it only heavier darker more powerful more melodic it is going to be you will love it and you know and you know what come and see us with doogie and you will you'll totally get it doogie is i've been all over the world with doogie because I, I would travel with the as graham's manager and essentially personal assistant on the michael schenker tours i've seen doogie on a good day i've seen doogie on a bad day and doogie doesn't have bad days doogie is a fantastic singer and graham's a doogie fan too you know as he said in his recent statement so you know, I thought Graham was very gracious towards Doogie. I think so. Uh, he wishes, he wishes nice us well. Yeah. He wishes us well, and we wish Graham well. I'm going to be. I hope someone sends me a, a pre-release copy of the uh, of the new Graham Bonnet solo album. Otherwise, I'm just going to go out to the store and I'm going to buy it because I am a fan. I love Graham Bonnet. Doogie White as 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 a musician. Rainbow. Okay, go ahead. And as a person. Good. That's nice. That's and that's nice. no lie. That's nice. And, 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 and you, I know you're sincere about that. I know you're sincere. Graham, Graham should do the Graham Bonnet. It, it should be Graham Bonnet. Uh, I, I mean, I personally don't think, I know he thinks that it's his band, Alcatraz, his band and all that. And I won't even argue that. But Graham has a name and the people that are supporting him online now, all the, the supporters, the hundreds of, uh, so I understand support that he's gotten. Um, and which by the way, it, it's, it's really a shame that a lot of these people are being very nasty towards myself, the rest of this band and Doogie and Giles. It's really a shame because these are all really good people. Uh, anybody that knows me, I've been around the business for 40 some years. Anybody that knows me knows that I wouldn't be hanging out with a bunch of losers and a bunch of assholes. So, uh, these are great people and it's really disappointing that people feel the need to do that through social media and all that stuff. So there's no need for that. You can, if you're not intelligent enough to speak your mind properly and be a gentleman about it or a lady about it, then you shouldn't be posting. But, uh, anyway, Graham should be Graham Bonnet. Because that's the support he's getting is for Graham Bonnet, not for Alcatraz. So, uh, and I, I don't, that's what he should do. And he should do what he does best. And that's, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, you know what? I think they're all fine. You, all of you will find happiness. You guys doing your thing, him doing his thing with his people, and you guys doing thing with your people. Probably it's the best solution, you know, and uh, I, I'm sure he just said he would start Alcatraz just, and again, I, I can't prove this, but just to sort of get under your skin, you know, is, <laughs> and we I, don't know yeah. what he's got planned, but um, we wish him well, we wish him health, we wish him strength. I still consider him a friend. I know that if I bumped into Graham on the street tomorrow, it might be awkward for the first couple of minute, minutes, but we'd be We'd be we'd be laughing and joking about something in about within about ten minutes. He's just that kind of guy, you know what I mean? I mean, maybe it just got to the point where, you know, when you don't speak to someone for a while, the the ice kind of hardens and then it becomes even harder to kind of reach out and whatever. But you know, we we all we all love Graham. He he was our he is our friend and he was our bandmate and he was our, our literally. I mean, I, I I don't say this lightly. He was our brother. We care about Graham a lot, and that is. That is not going to change. We're we're moving on. 
I wish him strength. I wish us strength. And we're going to, we're going to continue making the, the band. The guys are going to continue making the music that we started with the born innocent album. It is going to be absolutely a, you know, a continuation of that style in that vein and, you know, watch this space, you know, and live, we're going to do some damage with Doogie. I mean, and, and again, it's, it may be Graham's doing the kind of music he's, he's happier with. He's more comfortable with. I kind of see this a little bit similar to the Queens rack situation where Jeff Tate really had a direction in mind that just didn't, didn't, jive with the Queensryche what they were known for and where they wanted to go and eventually it came to a head and Jeff Tate can go and do his music the way he wants to do and then Queensryche can get on with being Queensryche and we're going to get on with being Alcatraz so I see it as very very similar uh, perhaps without the spitting and and whatever went on between those two camps but it's a, well, it's a different I mean, thing. And just just to give uh, Doogie a plug you know he's played with uh, Rainbow yep he's auditioned for Iron Maiden right I uh, didn't get the gig, but still to be to audition for and made in that. Just to get in that room, right? you got to be you got to be pretty good, you know. Yeah, uh, Tank. I'm trying to think of all the bands he's yep. played in. Uh, hey, I, you know how I put it best? Doogie White. He sung with Rainbow. He sung with <laughs> Ray Malmsteen. That's right. He sung Malmsteen. with Michael Schenker. Michael Sounds Schenker. like someone else we know. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, no. I think Doogie White. If you're gonna choose anybody to go on or move on with, he would definitely be the voice to move on with uh i met the guy great guy a great talent anything's possible and we're just taking baby steps right now we're looking at just you know we've got some we've got a, a tour booked with girls school uh we have some other tours i was just on the on the on the zoom today talking to a couple of agencies about some very exciting stuff uh we're just we're looking forward to just we're the, you know what, what the band want to do is play heavy metal in that and that's okay and that's okay. In that original Alcatraz style, updated, like what, like I said, I keep repeating myself, but like what you heard on the last Alcatraz record. So, and I just, I want to do, I mean, I want to be happy. I want to work with people that I want that are nice people and fun to work with, and uh, and I met Doogie a few times and hung out with him, but instant instant connection. I just, I love the guy, and he's got an amazing reputation as a person. And that's really important to me. After doing this for all these years and playing with some hotshot singer or player is one thing, but playing with a good person that also happens to be an amazing player or singer, that's just a plus and writer. So I'm looking forward to, I just want to, I just want to have fun playing music and I want to get on with it. And um, I want to be able to work. You know, Jimmy, I think when you play a certain type of music, that's kind of like, and you love playing that certain type of music, you're very, you're more motivated, like I said before. And when you're sort of being dragged into maybe a genre of music that you're not so happy with, that's kind of like when you feel like you have to push yourself, you're not motivated. I mean, that's just, that's the whole problem right there, you know, and perhaps, you know, and you know what, what's, and, what's and maybe he signed those contracts because he felt, you know, like he didn't want to disappoint everybody. But, you know, when we've all kind of, had that kind of thing you know right. well i get it i mean in this business there's a saying say yes till you have to say no yeah, yeah. but you know what the key is communication and Agreed. we could have we could Agreed. have worked we could have worked this out i really believe we could have worked this out well so, however any it's, last it's, sorry because we got like just a few minutes left any last closing remarks sorry to cut you off Giles. Well, I, I don't know i just say it's funny because graham and i share the same musical influences nobody loves the beatles more than me or the beach boys more than me so Graham, that's all Graham would talk about. We'd be cutting vocals and Graham and, and I both were talking about the Beach Boys and the Beatles. He would do a harmony and I would say, oh man, that's like a harmony off of yesterday and today or, or whatever, Rubber Soul or, or Sgt. Peppers or, uh, you know, you guys, and your, you guys and your Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know we both share the same thing. It's just that yeah, I, I also love extremely heavy music and I love these kind of guitar players. I, I think Joe is as good as it gets. And I love Ingve when Ingve was playing, he was amazing. Uh, his personality when we clashed, that was no fun, but but as a as a musician and a player, I loved it. And then it just kind of it it dissipated from that. And Steve was an amazing player. Yeah. Steve Vai. It was a little different direction. And after Steve left, I could sense that boy, we should have stuck with that no parole direction. And we didn't. 
uh, that third album through no fault of any one person in the band. That was a completely direct, directionless album. And uh, I'm not blaming any one person, but, uh, and that, that was the downfall right there. That's when we should have regrouped and thought about what the hell we're doing, but we didn't. Maybe, maybe this interview today and these statements and clarifications will heal, will heal the whole sort of situation. And, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no wound here. I mean, it's just all good vibes from our side, but we, we do want to do what we want to do. And that's, yeah. I, yeah. All right. Yeah. I think it's pretty simple. I think this is easy peasy, very simple. Everybody's going their own direction. Be happy and be friends, you know. And I respect Graham and I respect everybody in the Graham camp and Bethany and everybody else. They, they're wonderful. They're great musicians. Like, absolutely. And, and you know what? And Bethany is, she put up with a lot. You know, it's not easy being, oh. and, I, and I'm not, and this is certainly not a comment. That there's a lot of women and a lot of bands that are kicking ass and doing well. And she's, she's absolutely one of them. You know what I mean? She, Agreed. it's, it's tough being on the road with no sleep and, no, you know, so, a bunch of penny ass guys. Yeah, I get. Oh my that. god! I mean, she put, yeah. up with, yeah. she put up with so much crap, and she put up with it with a, with a with a perpetual smile. It's funny. I used to I used to always look forward coming down to breakfast in the morning because she was always there. She'd be up early and you know in the ho- you know in the hotel, and we'd always have a good chat. There was, you know, we had we certainly had some moments. You know, she damn near kicked my ass one time, but uh, that's uh, you know, that's that's something for the book. You know. <laughs> All right, guys, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, I wish you all the the luck in the future and looking forward Thank to you. whatever, you know, whatever the outcome may be, you know. Thank you. Hey, by God, we come up there with our chainsaw. Get on your ass, huh, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> Do okay. I talk like that? <laughs> Son of a whore, we come up there for your snow, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do I talk well, like that? Well, you know what? There's no parole from rock and roll. <laughs> no. Yeah. Exactly. Finally got to wear the shirt. For- I was going to, but I decided to go with a personal fight myself, actually. Yeah. All right, guys. I have, a great black, I have a black old Navy shirt. On. Oh, Is look, that- you're stripping. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, oh, yeah. I got a hoodie. I mean, shit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, you don't, Arthur. Right. <laughs> oh, uh, let me just tell everybody what's coming up here. What's coming up on the Metal Voice? Do I have it here? Let me just see if I could show everybody Michael Schenker. Michael Schenker is coming up on the Metal Voice, oh. so stay tuned. My old friend Michael. Yeah, got an interview coming up with him. Stay tuned. Also, I want to plug uh, Luke Caveras' son. He, uh, yep. For all of you out there who have not seen this, he's come out with a single, uh, a video, a beautiful song dedicated to Luke Caveras, who passed away uh, during, I guess it was March, about, due to COVID-19. Wonderful, wonderful song. Go check it out. It's called Lack, L-A-K, like Lou A. Kavaris. So great song, guys. Thank you again. We will talk soon. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.